Good morning again. <laughs> now you can hear me, right? Yes. Anyway, welcome to the October Veterans Meeting. Thank you for coming. And today we're going to have two veterans speak. These veterans have a combined 15 years in the Army Reserves. Before we hear from them, I want to talk about a, a uh, project that's called the Missouri <laughs> Veterans History Project. And that's the slide that's up here on the screen. The Missouri Veterans History Project is uh, supported by the Missouri Historical Society and the University of Missouri St. Louis Veterans <laughs> Studies Program. And the objective is to record a history of all Missouri veterans. And this starts with uh, kind of where you were born, how you, where you grew up, and focuses on your military experience. And this, I think, is a, in my opinion, a, a helpful project for veterans because I don't know if you've ever experienced someone, one of your ancestors or uncles or somebody dying, and then you think, oh my, I wish I would have talked to him about what he or she did when. And of course, it's too late. <coughs> this is a recording of this, of your, it's sort of like, remember the old story, the old program, This Is Your Life on TV? Well, it's not quite in depth like that. But anyway, it sort of covers your, your, uh, growing up and service. And there's a number of brochures over there on that table. And I would encourage you to sign up for this program and participate. And it's, uh, it's pretty easy to do. All these brochures over there have a business card of a guy named Larry Bassamo. And Larry Bassamo is a local volunteer for this project and about seven of us <coughs> veterans here have already done this and I would encourage you to. So the way it works is uh, you call Larry, there's a card with a phone number, you call Larry and say you're interested in participating in this and he will work with Jim to find a room that works for your time and the room's time. And there will be a Larry and a videographer will come and they'll record your story. You will be given a DVD of that recording and everything that's like 30 minutes or more will be accessible at the Missouri Historical Society and the Library of Congress because this story goes to Missouri Historical Society and from there to the Library of Congress. So I think it's a worthwhile project and if you're a veteran living in Missouri, that's who they're looking for. So please take a brochure. If we run out over there, I'll get some more. But there is a business card, and it's simply a matter of calling Larry, and he'll set it up for you. The interview will be here at Mason Point, as I indicated, because Jen finds a room. So are there any questions on that? OK, good. Now. Today we have, as I mentioned earlier, two veterans that together have 15 years in the Army Reserves. In this program of having veterans speak at the veterans meeting is a standard program that I've started four years ago. And we've had many of the veterans here speak. We've got quite a few more to go. but. If uh, some of the veterans seems to be a, seem to be a bit timid about doing this, so if you know a veteran 
living around you or wherever, living here but has not spoken, maybe you need to encourage them. So anyway, that's the program that we typically have. But in uh, November, it will be different. November, we'll have a program on Veterans Day, and we will have the super senior, super senior citizen singing, <laughs> or easier to say the Mason Park Choir. <laughs> anyway, they'll be here singing, and we have an outside speaker, the director of the, of the uh, Veterans Memorial in or the Soldiers Memorial is the proper name, in St. Louis, Mark Sundar. He's the director. He'll be here to talk about the history of Veterans Day, and he'll tell us about the Soldiers Memorial, which I know many of you have probably visited. But that will be a Veterans Day on November the 11th, which is Veterans Day, and it's not the first Monday like we usually meet, it's the second Monday. And there will be a lunch afterwards where all the veterans eat free. But you're required to make an, a registration for that so that the kitchen knows a little bit about who's coming. There will be a sign-up sheet, and it probably will be at the entrance to the back for your restaurant. It's not there now, but it will be there a week or so prior to the event on November the 11th. It will, it will be for you to sign up along with the time when you plan on eating so we don't inundate the, the uh, restaurant on any particular, particular time if everybody seems to go. But anyway, so that's coming up in November. And it's like today now, we're going to have two veterans talk to us. And these, uh, like I said earlier, have a combined 15 years in the Army Reserves. And they're Ken Stepper and Warner Bowler. I think Ken goes first, so please, uh, anyway, please uh, welcome them. And thanks all, thank to all the veterans here who have served. And Ken, you ready? Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. <coughs> fellow veterans and <coughs> fellow inmates at Mason Point. <laughs> <laughs> Just kidding, because we're very happy to be here. Uh, we have made many good friends here, and we're happy. My name is Ken Stetcher. I live in apartment 333 with my wonderful wife, Georgia, of 56 years this November the 7th. I have lived in the, my entire life in the St. Louis area. I was born in South St. Louis, on July 8, 1935. Moved to South County, March 1941, right before the war. Lived in South County 58 years, then moved to Lake St. Louis for 21 years, and then I've been here for the last four years. <clears throat> a little bit of my early history. <laughs> I lived in a flat with my parents and my sister until I was four and a half. One memorable thing happened there. My dad wanted to make a carpenter out of me like he and his father. He gave me a small hammer, some four penny nails, and some wood orange grating, and put me on the back porch to nail boards together, right? And went to work. When he came home, my mom told him I was on the porch hammering all day. I only came in when she called me for lunch. Dad went out to see what I built. I had nailed all the wood orange grating to the wood floor of the porch. <laughs> Thus, that was the start of my carpenter career. <laughs> I went to Seven Hundred Fathers Church and grade school in Afton, Missouri, and graduated in 1949. 
at Arlington Christian Brothers College, or call it CBC High School, because my mom wanted me to go there, not to St. Mary's with my other friends. She thought it would be good for me, and mom's no best. <coughs> I liked the brothers for teachers and respected their guidance, and I also liked the military training, graduated with the rank of the lieutenant colonel for the blonde. Very good. If this is the first time I did this, <laughs> that's when I graduated as lieutenant colonel. <laughs> I was in charge charge of half of the school, the second battalion, which was all military parades and things of that nature. I graduated in 1953 from CBC and then went to work for my father in his general contracting business for the first three years learning the trade. <clears throat> and then 11 more years as a foreman and superintendent, helping run the business, making out payroll, paying taxes, etc. In 1967, I started my own, let's get this guy off of here. <laughs> In 1967, I started my own construction business, hiring carpenters on payroll and using subcontractors for everything else. We did both residential, which included home, kitchens, bathrooms, remodeling, lower levels, rec rooms, etc., etc., new pillow windows and windows and doors and entries. And I also did commercial work, remodeling at Southside National Bank on Gravoy and Graham, and also the Little Sisters of the Poor, a home for the aged on Grand Avenue at Cherokee. We did all their remodeling and a large amount of their maintenance work <coughs> and other various commercial <laughs> businesses. I was married in 1956. <coughs> I had three wonderful children, two boys and a girl. I now have been married to my best friend and wonderful wife, Georgia, since 1968. She was my secretary, my bookkeeper in our business. And we had six children between the two of us. We lost two of our boys. In, 19, in 2021, our old, my oldest and her youngest, tough to bury your own children. We hope for many happy, we hope for many happy years with our new friends that we have gained here. <clears throat> On to the military part of my life. <coughs> I enlisted January the 6th, 1954, as a private first class due to the ROTC training that I had at CBC High School. In the active reserve of the 5th Army, 138th Infantry, 11th Corps, 11th Army Corps. I served for eight years and I had an honorable discharge on February 12th, 1962. My eight years of service were all between no conflicts. It was between Korea conflict and the Vietnam War. All were in peacetime. I was promoted several times, and lastly to Master Sergeant in charge of Weapons Platoon in 1958, until discharge in 1962. Fired everything. Camp. This one. 
case were, I don't know where those were taken. Hey, can, can you hold the mic up? Okay, all right, sorry, I'm not used to this. <laughs> the wrong way again. That's my honorable discharge. Fired everything in the military from 45 pistol to a carbine rifle, M1 rifle, uh, recoilless. 57 millimeter recoilless rifles, uh, a Jeep mounted recoilless rifle, and the mortars. I was in charge of the weapons platoon. That's the Jeep mounted recoilless <coughs> rifle. We spent one night every week at home here in St. Louis in the armory on Market Street training in classes. And then two full weeks every summer at Camp McCoy and Camp Ripley in Wisconsin. I did serve on active duty for the state of Missouri because of tornado duty. <laughs> we were paid by the state here. I had an interesting experience after one of the tornadoes we were to protect businesses, mostly taverns, <laughs> in a rough neighborhood around Vanderbender and Sarah here in St. Louis uh, from the looting that was taking place. The first night was extremely cold and calm with no looting. One of the tavern owners there invited us to come in and help ourselves to whatever we wanted to drink. <laughs> <coughs> Fortunately, it was so cold it was a lucky break because we were not issued any ammo for our rifles. <laughs> and that, whatever, but anyway. Uh, the second night, word was out about the ammo not being issued. So the natives were getting a little restless <laughs> and aggressive. So we fixed bayonets and that brought calm back again. <laughs> Second experience, uh, my first two week summer camp in Wisconsin, I was a PFC on KP duty with another private and we were in the back of a deuce and a half truck taking a lunch and lemonade out to the troops in the field. I could never understand why officers in charge of all the troops always put the most expensive piece of equipment, the deuce and a half truck, in the hands of a fresh, new, enlisted man who didn't know anything. Maybe it's because the drivers never advanced in rank. <laughs> Anyway, this driver forgot to release his this driver forgot to release the emergency brake. We were halfway out to the troops when the brakes started smoking. By the time we got the driver to stop, the brakes were burning. He did not have the fire extinguisher with him. The only thing we had was the lemonade. <laughs> subdued breaks until we could get out to the field. The troops were not very happy that they had to drink water that was parked in a truck that was parked in the field instead of lemonade. Another incident, a tornado hit our summer camp. It was only just uh, boards about three foot high and then tents above that held uh, 12 men each. And of course the tornado did a little damage to the tents and our clothes were scattered everywhere and they were wet. And uh, everything had to be repaired and dried out. It made our life a little bit more difficult there if it wasn't difficult enough already. <laughs> Fourth incident was while we were training in the field, while we were training in the fields with our 60 millimeter mortars, we were firing Willie Peter, our white phosphorus. 
rounds at old trucks that were parked in, as targets. Some of them, Willie Peter, the last foul of five, found their way to the ruins nearby, and we had a fire that was out of control for several hours. So we were enlisted as firefighters. We used our foxhole shovels and the drinking water from the trucks in the field again with the troops. We finally got, the, got it under control, though. Fifth instance, when we, I was a master sergeant in weapons platoon, and we had a very disturbed private who told his buddies that he was going to kill the squad leader who was picking on him and mean to him. He stole some ammo from the rifle range while he was out there practicing. Word got out to us, thankfully. Another sergeant and myself jumped him and disarmed him of his loaded M1 rifle. He was dishonorably discharged from the 5th Army. Next incident. While we were on bivouac for several days, everybody's going to like this one. <laughs> Everyone needed a bath by the end of the second day, so we used the river. All few hundred of the guys hopped in the river and started bathing in the river. <clears throat> there was a weather and news helicopter flying overhead. <laughs> Dipped down close for a look for quite a while. <laughs> we didn't think a whole lot of it, because there were so many of us. Until we found out later that the newscaster was a woman. <laughs> I wonder if she reported her interesting time that day. <laughs> Next incident, uh, seven other sergeants and myself and two officers tried out for the expert infantryman medal. It involved several things you had to accomplish. 12 mile hike <clears throat> with a full pack on your back and a M1 rifle. <coughs> You had accomplished this 12-mile hike in less than three hours. Second, the bayonet, bayonet course and hand grenade throwing course, and a course on landmines, physical tests, push-ups, chin-ups, weight pull-ups. So many had to be done in a certain amount of time. Lastly, map reading with the use of a compass. Uh, we had a daytime course up at Camp Ripley. We went, you, had, uh, you were given a uh, paper with a certain azimuth. I don't know if you're familiar with what azimuth is, but that's a reading on your compass. And, and uh, had to march so many, a distance of so much on that azimuth, and then you had on another azimuth, and so on until you finally came out at the end of the course on a road to, to make sure that you knew just what you were doing. It was not too difficult, and uh, all of us came out on the road in pretty much the same spot. But then there was a night course with the, with the uh, compass, and you had to use a buddy with a handkerchief, and you shot an azimuth, and then he walked out on that azimuth until you couldn't hardly see him anymore, or stop, and then you'd go up to him, and then he'd go keep going until you march, march the right amount of distance, not march, walk the right amount of distance, and then a different azimuth, and so on, and a different azimuth in a different direction, a different direction, until you came out on a road. All eight sergeants came out within 50 feet area of the, of the road. We waited more than an hour late at night, and finally a truck with his lights on showed up and said, we all missed our spot. <laughs> the two officers, of course, were with that Jeep. 
that model. It wasn't a Jeep, it was a truck. And they were a couple hundred yards away. Sergeants did not agree, so the next day they re-ran the course and found out they had made a mistake when they set up the course and all eight sergeants came out at the right spot and the two officers did not. <laughs> All eight sergeants received our expert infantrymen medals at camp. I'm sure the officers got theirs later or someplace else. <laughs> this is the eighth and last incident. Uh, while firing mortars <coughs> at targets, we had our first and one and only misfire. Live rounds stayed in the mortar tube. We had to bring that two up again. You know what it was. Just the two. Okay. Uh, a second lieutenant and myself, second lieutenant and myself, had to remove the misfire and they had to be sent to uh, ordnance back at camp. So the second lieutenant picks up the base of the tube until the live rounds come sliding out the other end of the tube where I was. <laughs> I had to cover the end of the tube with my hands, actually your thumbs, like this, so that the uh, round could come out of the tube and you could catch it. I had to make sure I didn't come in contact with the high explosive detonator end in the center of the round or it would blow up. It was the most tense moment, but obviously we were successful since I'm here with all my body parts. <laughs> the only other thing I have I don't know if anybody wants to play a little game of catch with me.
And then uh, in our uh, seventh week of basics, they started giving us assignments for our follow-up training. And both this friend of mine and myself were both in the headquarters of the 102nd. We were basically clerks. So we were supposed to be clerk typists at Fort Leonard And they read off his name and my name and it said, Light Weapons Infantry, Fort Knox, Kentucky. <laughs> I said, you made a mistake. They said, enjoy Fort Knox. <laughs> so, we monitored a bus, went to, uh, down to Fort Knox with a stop at Scott Air Force Base for lunch. And at that time we realized we were in the wrong branch of the service. We saw their mess hall, and man, that was a dining room, not a mess hall. So we got down at Fort Knox, and we started our training. And by the way, that's basic training, 17. I was half the man I am now. <laughs> we started our training with light weapons, which consists of the M1 Garand, uh, the Browning automatic rifle, which held a 20, 20 round clip, uh, the Browning 30 caliber machine gun, which was belt driven, belt fed, 57 millimeter uh, regardless rifle, 60 millimeter mortar, and a 3.5 inch rocket launcher, which replaced the uh, bazooka from World War II. And we'd go out on different ranges and fire these weapons. And they'd have old buses and old cars as targets, which was a lot of fun for 18. And by that time I was 18, it was a lot of fun because nobody was shooting back at you. <laughs> um, Ken talked about having uh, guard duty with no ammunition and a rifle. You know, we were guarding Fort Knox, and when you were on guard duty, you had an empty rifle, empty M1. <laughs> it did a lot of good. After uh, completing, well, that's the founding on my grandpa. That's my graduation from Fort Knox. Like, like, like. That's the graduation from Fort Knox to the uh, uh, Light Weapons Infantry. Uh, I got one slide out of, out, of, out, of, out of sequence here. After I got back to uh, active duty, or active reserve duty in 1957, I was picked as the general's flagger. <coughs> for parades and reviews. That's me with the flag, and that's the general staff of the 102nd Infantry Division marching at Cape McCoy, Wisconsin. Uh, the guy on the right is the cousin of my friend who was the G2. And uh, back, back in the active reserve, it was back to one night a week doing uh, uh, Meeting, re training meetings, and then uh, every uh, January after after '58, uh, I would go with the Adjutant General to Fort Sheridan, Illinois, for a paper war against Fifth Army, and we'd go up on, on a train, and we would all end up in the in the club car, and comments were made like. Hell, it looks like World War II all over again. Because <laughs> we were all, the club car was taken over by all soldiers. And um, we would go to Camp McCoy every summer for two weeks. And because I was with the Adjutant General, I ended up doing two and a half weeks. I was part of the advance party, which would get us up there three or four days early to get things set up for everybody coming up for the two weeks. And uh, that, that carried on every year from uh, the first summer I went up there with 57 to uh, 63. Uh, 
in uh, 1963, December 31st, 1963, I received my honorable discharge from the reserves. So it's uh, not quite eight years, almost eight years, but with starting in January of 56 to December of 63. We didn't have any skinny dipping <laughs> or anything like that exciting. But uh, we did, a bunch of us did at 17, find the Tolman Tap in Cobo, Wisconsin. And <laughs> we did that every night we could get off base. So that's basically what I have to say. Any questions? Did you continue friendship with the, Mr. Bush? Not really, no. <laughs> he went on to be an executive in the Mr. Bush. <laughs> I went on to work at St. Louis Ship. Oh, you made me work for him. Uh, would have been good to do that, though. He was, he was really a pretty hard worker at, uh, in basic, you know. His dad raised him the right way, started him on the sables cleaning the stables. And he learned the, the brewery industry from the bottom up. So. I have a question, Warner. Uh, is it just me, or does the flag look a little tattered? Yeah. No, it's, uh, it's frayed on the edge. It's not tattered. It's just frayed on the edge. It's just the wind, right? Yeah. <coughs> that's the that's a assistant commander. He's a one star. Uh, I also carried for the uh, two-star, who was the commanding general, William Harrison. And uh, when we had a, re a parade in St. Louis where they had a reviewing stand, I would be on the reviewing stand with the two-star flag. And I was on this, uh, the uh, reviewing stand with the likes of the Secretary of the Army, Brucker, and uh, the actor, Joel McRae, who was the guest uh, at the, at, on the parade. And you, know, you don't realize how tall some of these actors are. <laughs> and a big white suit, cowboy suit. <laughs> Looked like he was about two feet higher than me. <laughs> oh. How did you get the big flag there? I'm sorry? How did you get the big flag there? The general like the creases in my uniform. <laughs> Thanks to my mother and the ironing, I ironed them, she, she washed them and starched them. My mom taught me ironing when I was about 13. She said, I'll wash them, you iron them. So. Anybody else? Okay, Hank. Thanks to both of you, I think we enjoyed the, I did, and uh, thanks for volunteering to do this, and uh, remember now, our next veterans meeting is November the 11th, which is the second Monday in November, and uh, the program will start at 10 o'clock in this room, and we'll have the Mason Point Choir, We'll have a director of the Soldiers Memorial in St. Louis talk. And uh, there will be lunch afterwards, of which you much must make reservations. And there will be a sign-up sheet later in the uh, entrance to the room, to the Mason Point restaurant at 40. And uh, veterans eat free, only veterans, I'm told. And I don't know if there's any questions about that. Well, if not, thank you all for coming. And special thanks to Ken and Warner for entertaining us.